Hi, and welcome to the Signal Path. In this episode, I've got another repair for you guys. I know these are probably your favorite type of videos. This is an HP 8562E. This is a 30 hertz to 13.2 gigahertz spectrum analyzer. It's actually really similar to the E4405B in terms of a frequency span and, and everything else. And I'm curious to see what it looks like on the inside. And this one actually doesn't have the first low output uh, termination, but I think I do have one lying around. I think this one would be good. We can put that there. Not that it matters because it doesn't work right now anyway. And I actually have a couple more units to repair too. I have uh, at least three more aside from this one. So we'd like to get through them. So as I said, this one doesn't power on. It's already plugged in. Let's go ahead and try it out. And nothing. But as you can see, in the, in the time that I try to turn it on and off, there is this brief delay and this light comes on. Now, this is could be an indicative of some kind of a short where the power supply tries to power on, it can and immediately shuts off. So interesting, that could be that, but I have to open it and see what the actual uh, architecture of it is. But nonetheless, I think we should get to it, take it apart and see what it looks like on the inside and look at the power supply. All right, here's a look inside and well, this is what we're dealing with. This is an exceptionally compact unit. So let me just show you what it looks like all around. If I rotate it, so you can see from the side here and from the front, it's really, really compact. I think I've opened one of something similar to this before, so I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with the structure, but if there is anything that indicates this is supposed to be serviced or serviceable to some extent, <laughs> it's this diagram right here. So this diagram tells the technician or whoever is opening it exactly how to lay the unit to the side such that these things, these boards will open up because you can see they're on hinges and that's how you can access the inside of the unit. It looks obviously like this. You only see in the back of the PCBs. All the components are on the other side. So there's instructions on how to do that. This is from the good old days when these instruments were component uh, serviceable, not module serviceable. So let me put it to the side, open it from um, each side and see which one is easier to access the power supply. Okay, moving along to this assembly here. So I took the screws out and this thing folds down and it's in layers like cake. And uh, <laughs> it's pretty complicated, I have to say. There are a lot of layers and uh, each of them have certain functionality, obviously. Different, different uh, boards for different things, IF sections, uh, LO sections, synthesizer sections, digital sections, and so on. So uh, yeah, I see a, a bit of discoloration here and that discoloration seems to be coming from here. I don't know if that's burnt, but the power supply is under uh, this unit here. So let me focus here. So I just took the screws off. I haven't taken this out yet, but I think it should just slide out. There's more instructions on here, of course. And uh, let's see. Oh, geez, it's enormous. That's going to be difficult to deal with. So that's the power supply. Clearly, the high voltage power supply section is also here for driving the CRT. And you can see that by the proximity of the controls in the back uh, and everything connected to here. So the high voltage power supply and the main power supply are part of the same unit. There you go. Let me just move this a little bit so we can get a better idea. And uh, yeah, there we are. So now we have to take a close look and see what is going on if there is a short somewhere. But unfortunately, this is, is just in a terrible, terrible spot and and it is definitely screwed in that's going to be tough it's really crazy how complex this is and uh, normally so th there's a, a shift in paradigm about th the way these were designed so as opposed to stacking them like this they now have modules that just stick into a back plane a motherboard as opposed to connecting them with big huge thick cables uh, so the, the structure, the architecture has changed, and I think a lot of that is thanks to the fact that you don't need this anymore. And removing this changes the mechanical concentration of this unit considerably. You don't have this high voltage section that has to be completely isolated up here, for example. All of this goes away. It just makes it so much more interesting. And the interconnect, backplane interconnect between different modules has improved so much because now you can have RF connectors that directly plug into backplanes and then you have very good quality backplanes for uh, connections between the units and that reduces the need to have these big boards with a lot of components on them. You can connect uh, various data boards much easier to each other. So yeah, this is uh, very interesting and uh, yeah, unfortunately it's going to be quite a, quite a nightmare to figure out, but you know what, you're gonna take it one step at a time and see what happens. And here is the power supply. I took it out of the case and it was really, really difficult to do. It's not very easily disassembled. And uh, there we go. So it, it has a very typical structure for a switching power supply. 
input common mode uh, and inductors there is the main bridge rectifier this is the, goes to the switch some protection circuits startup circuitry the main capacitor bank after the bridge rectifier some switching some transistors and here some more transistors here's the uh, voltage regulators and some board here i'm not sure exactly what that does at the moment decoupling cap for all the different voltages that are generated and some feedback circuitry and this stage that you see here is for the high voltage power supply which of course i took off so another question is well what is happening with it well even though it is outside of the unit i can power it on and remember whenever you're doing one of these you have to use an isolation transformer that's really really important it's a major safety issue so let's go ahead and plug this in isolation transformers turned off so I could bring the isolation transformer up slowly which we can do later on when we're testing it but let me just turn it on and see what happens uh, by the way I, I've done one other thing on the other side of this I've installed two wires two jumpers there to short the circuit as if the power on is pressed basically so here we go and I don't know if you can hear it or not but it makes a squeaky noise every once in a while which is a very classic sign of it trying to start and quite not quite making it so this can be a whole bunch of different things it could be the startup circuitry it could be a short of the output it could be a dead transistor on the outside uh, on the other side of the transformer there are just so many different things that can be wrong with it but what is really lucky is that we have a block diagram of this power supply that's going to make diagnostics so much easier so let's take a look at the block diagram and see what we should do next and here is the block diagram of the power supply now we can go through this very quickly because it's not very detailed and it has all the logical components you would expect from a dc dc converter power supply so let's take a look at that i'm going to zoom in a little bit to the beginning of it so we can go through it one step at a time probably not zoomed in a little bit too much here we go so the very one of the very first thing i've done is to short these together this is just from the power switch that basically turns it on as soon as you apply an ac power coming from here and that ac power is coming from my isolation transformer which is safe again as I just mentioned so there's some input filter and so on so we can check to make sure the input filter is okay but I suspect that that's all fine because I do hear this power supply try to start so which means that there is definitely some voltage present so I'm not concerned with this section so the very first thing is going to be the input rectifier very classic and we have a test point to measure the input rectifier so we will know exactly what kind of voltages to expect and we can definitely take a look at that now after that we're going to have the buck regulator and the dc dc converters circuitry these are the active portions which are the, these are the switching components of the power supply and given the fact that there's some noise happening and some behavior seems to be going on in the once it tries to start so there's something going on with these devices so that would be certainly worthwhile to look at but as you can imagine, when you first turn on the power supply, there has to be a way for it to start. This oscillation of the DC-DC converter has to start. Some, something needs to kickstart it. And in fact, there is a kickstart bias circuitry uh, with a test point right on there. So this will, when you apply the power the first time, the input rectifier is working. It gets some energy from that and then creates some biasing and some kick. And it starts the buck regular control circuitry, which then ultimately will control the buck regulator, which makes sense. And the DC-DC converter is also depends on this buck regulator control, which then controls the DC-DC converter. All of that makes sense. These are all startup conditions. All DC-DC power supplies must have something similar to this. After that, you have the rectifiers and the filters and so on, which then generate some voltages, which are the result of the DC-DC conversion after the buck regulation. Now, from that, we can take some voltage back this is our sense line essentially and that is up to isolated from the rest of the circuit this is what creates the isolation from the power supply so you get isolation galvanically through the transformer and you get isolation optically through these up to isolator so this this is what makes the power supply safe essentially and then this feedback voltage comes over here and then influences the buck regular control which then can adjust the dc dc converter pulse widths required for the dc dc converter and then the whole regulation happens i've talked about this many times before but the block diagram is very classic after that we're going to have our main voltage regulators these are going to generate all the voltages that the instrument needs nicely labeled test points for all of them and you can see quite a few different power supply voltages are required some power up circuitry here not quite sure what that does exactly or maybe it actually is coming all the way from here so it must be something maybe signaling to the, the instrument when the power is available. Now here's a CRT power supply. I've taken that out anyway. We're going to ignore that. This is not the cause of the problem anyway. There's VTF supply. It says y, YTF on here. YTF could be YIG tuned filter. I don't know why this says VTF. 
anyway, so that probably not going to be an issue either. So given the fact that it's starting and it's making some noise when it starts, I would start investigating from here, the kickstart circuitry, the block regulation control and so on. So these would be the places to start looking. And these test points have some descriptions in the service manual, which is great. And we're going to be able to look at those. So back to the power supply, continuing on. Okay, let's measure the rectifier voltage first. And I'm going to do some, make, put some effort into kind of rotating through my instruments and uh, using different instruments for different repairs and different experiments. So today we're going to be using the Roden Shores RTB 2004. And we're going to do some of our time domain measurements with that. So anyway, having said that, let's go ahead and connect this to the rectifier voltage, which is uh, right over here. This is not turned on right now, obviously. And I'm in low Z mode. And sorry about this reflection. It's coming from the overhead light there. So let's go ahead and enable this and see what we get. There we go. There it is. So we got a spike at AC at first, which makes sense. That was during power on. And we have 315 volts on it. Looks good. So that's not the problem. So the problem is... Uh, coming from somewhere else. So that's our first measurement point. So let me turn that back off. And you can see that we will uh, begin to discharge the capacitor fairly quickly. That's uh, normal. So that point is good. Now the next point of measurement is the bias point for the kickstart circuit. Let's see what that looks like. OK, so the output of the test point 206 is connected to the startup circuitry. And that's supposed to be 14 volts. So we can measure that very easily. Now this time I'm going to put it onto measuring regular DC voltages. I'm going to connect it to test point 206. And we're going to apply the power again and see if we get anything close to what we we're supposed to, about 14 volts. So here we go. And uh, oh, it looks like it's pulsing. And it, it's related. It's kind of correlated with the pulses that I'm hearing. So I don't know if you can hear it or not, but there's definitely something going on. I think to see exactly its behavior, it's probably time to take a look at the scope. OK, we have the instrument set to roll mode. Let's turn it on and see what happens. And there it is. As you can clearly see, we have these pulses. Now, these pulses do reach uh, somewhere around the area that we want them to be. They, they do reach almost 14 volts here. So 15 volts is right there. So you can see as soon as they reach there, there's some spikes there. And those spikes are spikes of activity. Uh, due to this thing trying to start. And then, of course, it collapses. So we have to now take a step further and see the, the component that causes the pulses, if whether that those pulses are actually there at the correct amplitude, so that we know that the pulse circuitry is working also. OK, now we're connected to the location of the kickstart circuit, where we're supposed to see pulses 200 millisecond in duration. Let's see if they're there. And yes, they are indeed there, and they go to the correct amplitude. So the scale here is a half a second uh, per step there. So yep, you can see that the pulses are there. So the kickstart circuitry is working. It does try to wake up the power supply, but it's not successful. So something else is going on. And there are a couple of other things we can actually monitor. So we can monitor all the test points that are the outputs of all the voltage regulators. These are the final stages of the power supply output. This is what gets driven onto the unit itself. And because we know it partially starts, we can monitor and see if those outputs become established, even for a short amount of time. And then if they're not established, that means that there's a problem in that path. So we can kind of work our way from the output backwards now that we, now that we know the input circuitry is most likely OK. So let's go ahead and do that and try a, a couple of them. So I'm going to turn on the power supply periodically and make some measurements. So I have the test points written here, as you saw in the diagram that I just spoke about. So let's try one of the typical ones, let's say test point number 303. Now, test point 303 should be a minus 15 volt supply. Now, if I can find test point 303, that would be great. Uh, I think it's hidden over here. So this should be test point 303. The power supply is not on right now. You just have to be careful because this thing has high voltages for the power supply, the other power supply all over it. So if I turn this on, we should see at least some negative 15 volts established briefly if it's working. There you go. And you can see this is minus 10, this is minus 20. So we do get minus 15, and it does get established, and then the power supply turns off. So that minus 15 volt supply is actually working. And some, some problem must be somewhere else. So let's try another one. Let's say uh, 306 we can try, or 302 we can try. 302 is plus 15. Uh, so that's the opposite of this one. And the test point 302 is, I believe, this one over here. OK, let's try that. 
Ah, that's not bad. Look at that. That's uh, plus 15. So plus 15 is also getting established. That's also very promising. So that means the plus and minus 15 volt supply is working. And that's a fundamental, it's a very big por portion of this power supply is that. And that comes from the plus and minus 17 volts generated by the rectifier filter. So that means that portion of the circuit is most likely working. So now let's look at the next big supply. That's supply 28 volts, which is generated from 34 volts. So that's test point 304. Now, here it is, test point 304. So on this one, I expect to see a large voltage. If I can get that down there, there it is. Here I expect to see 28 volts. Let's see if it's there. And, yeah, that's 28 volts, all right, because this is 30 up here. So 28 volt, it's working. So that's, that's also a huge, uh, important one. That's also working. I'm pretty happy with that. So what is left? Uh, there's not that many left, actually. Plus or minus 15 is working. Uh, let's try minus 12.6. That's an unusual one. Minus 12.6 is test point 305. And where is that? Test point 305. Oh, it's over here. It's on leg of this diode here. Let's try that. Uh, minus 12.6. And? Ah, look at that. Check it out. We don't get it. It tries, but it doesn't quite get there. Interesting. Now, that is the first promising measurement we've done so far. So yes, it doesn't work. The minus 12.6 volt supply is not there. Now we can investigate and see what that's connected to. Well, it turns out there's actually a mistake on the solder mask of this board. And that point that I was measuring, even though it was labeled as a correct test point, was just ground, which means that that was not the right place anyway. And it, the negative 12.6 volt supply is working perfectly fine. And it means that none of the output portion is shorted. So whatever is causing this thing to continue to restart and kickstart, is not because of a short of the output. At least, I don't think so at this moment. Which means that the problem must be somewhere at the primary side. So if you recall, this thing does a kickstart. It turns on this transistor. This transistor then charges the necessary circuitry here to provide temporary energy for the kickstart to happen. Once the kickstarts happen, all the switching devices begin working, and another secondary transformer turnover here will provide sufficient energy to keep the device continue to operate after the kickstart event has finished. It means that the kickstart happens, but whatever is responsible for continuing the operation after the kickstart stops isn't working. Now, this could be from the opto is or feedback network. It could be another device here. We have to figure it out. So I thought, well, one of the good things to test is to make sure that the gate drivers, which drive the transistors for the switching part of the dc dc converter, are actually working. Now, since I didn't have a replacement, and there were more than one on this board, I thought that I'll put them on a socket, and I'll swap them. By swapping them, if one of them isn't working, for instance, I would know. So I did that, I put them on a socket, and I turned the power supply on. Of course, I forgot to put one of them back. And it was just sitting on the table, and I turned it on without putting this back, and as you know, the gates of these devices will be floating and they get pulled up, which means that they get turned on and dump all the energy of the capacitors instantly onto the transformer, which is essentially a short circuit. It has very low resistance and that destroys all of the devices. So in one simple mistake, I basically broke <laughs> almost everything that was on the primary side of the transformer. So those are all gone. Now we took a huge leap backwards I got to go back and change all of these devices before we even get back to where we were. So yeah, mistakes were made and I'm going to have to do that. So bear with me. I'm going to grab some components. I ordered them from DigiKey. I'm going to go replace all of these and then hopefully we'll get back to where we were. So for completeness, let's look at the driver IC. So by removing this IC, the inputs to the switching transistors on the buck converter were completely floating and therefore pulled out and as I described, did a cascade failure and everything. So these driver ICs are very simple. They're very common used in basically every DC-DC converter circuit and their only job is to convert a CMOS or a TTL level logic to a voltage that is suitable for driving these switching MOSFETs on the buck converters. Now the reason these switching MOSFETs are difficult to drive is partially because they're huge. They're large devices, they have a lot of capacitance on their gates and they need larger voltages in order to switch huge amounts of current into the transformer. And as you can see, the diagram is really, really simple. And the idea is that you would bias this with a power supply voltage that is very high, up to 18 to 20 volts, and therefore the output A and output B would be able to reach almost that voltage. This is a CMOS process at the output driver portion, as you can see. Therefore, it can reach very close to the supply voltage.
And the input can then be a CMOS compatible node. As you can see, the CMOS input would be, it has some protection, direct protections, and it's got a common source amplifier, which then gets translated to rail to rail outputs of these inverting and non inverting uh, inverter blocks and automatically driving this uh, output block into the output. So the idea here is that this will first of all provide isolation and provide a lot of driving capabilities because these devices at the output are fairly large. Now one thing you need to watch out for is you need to make sure you buy the inverting or the non-inverting configuration of this IC depending on what's in the power supply. Remember if you flip this from an inverting to non-inverting you actually change the sign of the feedback network in the DC-DC converter and you will go from positive net uh, negative feedback to positive feedback and it would be catastrophic because by inverting this the PWM width as they reduce the PWM width and they would expect the output voltage to drop here reducing the PWM will increase the output voltage because it would be inverting and then that would cause a whole bunch of problem positive feedback and it's going to blow up all the devices again so you also have to be careful to purchase the correct version of this driver anyway just wanted to give you a little hint of what this IC does now we go back to do our repair well, that was a disaster. I had to change all of these. Most of these died because of my mistake. Uh, but I did find a couple of other issues. So the main driver I see, I forget which one it is now, uh, which drives the entire PWM for the DC-DC converters was actually faulty. So I replaced that one and the other ones died during the incident. Some capacitors were a little bit leaky, but I think it's good now. I think it should be working. You can see I checked all the capacitors, a bunch of labels, I removed a couple of components, tried it out, made sure everything is working properly. But unfortunately with the power supply like this, I can't test it on its own, even though it runs, uh, but uh, you cannot test it without load. This needs to be under load. Now you can make a custom load and make a cable for it, but that's a lot of work. The best load for something like this is, well, the instrument itself. So I'm gonna go put it back. We can turn on the unit and see if we can get it back up and running. All right, slowly putting it back together. And uh, I have, you know, I've only cried a few times up to this point because this thing is a nightmare. And uh, almost in place though, the cables have to be very carefully placed, especially in this area, because when this falls back, you're gonna pinch the cables and it's gonna be a whole bunch of problems. This thing is a nightmare. I can't believe that they've assembled it in this way. Anyway, so continuing on, we're almost there. Okay, everything is back together and plugged in. I'm about to turn it on, and there's a couple of LEDs here at the edge of this module. These LEDs are actually labeled with all the power supply voltages. You can see them, the labels are on the other side. It's plus and minus 15 volts, plus and minus five volts, and another one which I can't quite remember. And uh, if these turn on, then power supply is good, so it's all plugged in. Let's turn it on and see what happens, and check it out. Not too bad. So they're all functioning and I can hear the device booting. So now before I let it completely boot, let's turn it back off again. Uh, and looks like the power supply is good. So now the question is, is there any other damage internally to this? And see if I close it all back up and it's just a nightmare to work with this thing. I hope I don't have to open it again. So let's go ahead and take a look at the front, turn it back on and see how the booting process goes if it goes through all the alignments. And then of course, we'll have to put some signals into it. And here's the unit powered on, and well, at first glance it looks good, but actually there are a couple of issues with it still. So this is not the end of our journey here. So we have error 319 here. This is actually a warning. It just means that the DAC that controls the gig oscillator has reached its limit or very close to its limit. So this is a, not a good sign. And if I go under recall, I can look at some of the other errors. So we have that error. Then what else do we have? Uh, oh, there's a bunch of these. Now we have frequency acquisition error. We have search, FLD, I don't know what that is. There's set filter, must be some filter problem. LO amplitude is a problem. Uh, so these are essentially related, I think. Uh, so the LO amplitude is a serious one uh, because it means that there is no, well, there's no LO signal in some frequencies. So we should be able to find out if that is really the case or not. Well, we have two ways of checking it because we can obviously apply a signal at the input and we can look at the first LO output because this one has the first LO available to us and the LO of this particular instrument is between 3 to 7 gigahertz or so. So we should be able to look at that and see if that LO is present in between all the frequencies it's supposed to actually be and that's going to be pretty helpful as a starting point. So maybe that's the best way to do it. Let's go ahead and, and, and take a look at LO signal. Okay, connected the signal from that directly to my spectrum analyzer. So we can go ahead and look closely at the spectrum analyzer and find out if this uh, signals actually make sense. Let me align this a bit. Okay, here we go. So obviously the instrument is sweeping. So we see the yellow signal jumping all over the place. But what I can do is I can change the sweep time on our spectrum analyzer. So let me go ahead and change that here. 
So let's uh, set the sweep time to, uh, let me preset this, let's see, what would be a good time? Maybe 15 seconds would be good. There you go, so now it's going to sweep very slowly, and there you go, we can see the yellow signal sweeping. I've already set this between two and a half gigahertz to seven gigahertz, so we should be occupying almost all of it. But as you can see, yeah, there's definitely some problem here. Take, take, keep an eye out in this area. So you can see it disappears and it comes back. So yeah, there should be here. It briefly shows up at very low amplitude, but doesn't really make it out. So something is wrong with the yellow generation, but it does work for a quite a wide range of it, but it doesn't seem to work for all of it. So if I slow it down and further to 30 second sweep, we can see that yes, so it's good over here. And then we can continue. It goes away all the way to the end of its range, but at the beginning it doesn't. Yeah, it takes a while for it to come back. And then, yeah, so around, around four and a half gigahertz, it comes back. Yep, so the first one and a half gigahertz of the YIG oscillator doesn't seem to work. So, yes, that means we have to open it back up and look at the block diagram and see if we can figure out what's going on with it. Well, and here's the other side of the instrument. So the first side we saw was where the power supply was and some of the other boards, and this side is where all the synthesizer and the RF components are. So now we can see a couple of boards here. This board is responsible for controlling the YIG tuned oscillators, some of the switches and attenuators and so on. all of those things are controlled by this board. And the board underneath it is a synthesizer, there's a sampler from the LO comes into this board and that's what closes their PLL loop. But if I look up here, I can see some of the critical RF blocks. So at the bottom here we have some of the filters, here's the attenuator, here's the first converter I believe, or it could be the YIG tuned filter, I'm not sure. Right behind this cable which you cannot see is our YIG tuned oscillator. Here's the LO distribution network, here's the first mixer, another external filter, and so on. So this is an interesting place to look because the point that I was looking at before was the output of this block. This is a LO distribution network, and it goes to the front. This point right over here is the front connector. I actually have a cable to it connected right here. This point over here comes directly from the YIG tune oscillator. So if I look at this point and I don't see the frequencies I'm supposed to see, it means that this block isn't even producing them. So if it's not producing them, then, it's, then the rest of it, it doesn't even matter. So we have to figure out if that is a fault of the YTO or the fault of something else in the chain. Now, the YTO obviously will not produce the correct frequencies if the driving circuitry isn't asking for the proper coil voltages to generate that. So we can also look at the coil voltages as a function of time and see if they correlate with what they're supposed to. But first thing first, let's disconnect this, hook it up to the spectrum analyzer and see if we see anything interesting. All right, here we are tapping directly to the YTO's output and going to the spectrum analyzer. And interestingly enough, we actually see the same behavior. So if you look here, the signal, this is directly from the oscillator, so it can be it's not influenced by any amplifier or anything following it. So you can see the signal disappears, and then it will show up somewhere here. So it's good up until the upper range of the YIG oscillator. So you can see 5, 6, six gigahertz, 6.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz, and then it drops, and then it takes a while before it comes back. The, the time where you don't see anything, it should have been around here, close to 3 gigahertz. So it's not, it's not quite working, but what I can do is I can monitor the YIG voltage, the, the voltage on the coil of the YIG oscillator, so you can see it, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not measuring it right now, but I'll measure it in just a second, and then you can correlate this voltage with what you see on the screen, and you'll see that the voltage is actually sweeping correctly, even for the region where the signal is not present. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm going to connect it, so you're gonna see something uh, that's sweeping with time, and then we're gonna be able to correlate that. So let me connect this up to pin number five, there it is. So here's the YIG voltage. Now you can see it's dropping, so it's tuning, and then it goes high. So th there you go, at around 11, 11 and a half, nothing, still 11.0, nothing, and then only you see it around 10.7 or 10.8 volts. So the, the coil voltage on the YIG oscillator is definitely sweeping in the entire range, but obviously unsuccessful in producing a signal at the voltages where it's about 11 volts. So something is going on. I wonder if that's the problem with the YIG itself or this range of this voltage is simply not right. Well, I'm not sure what to do next. Uh, I would say probably it would be a good idea to take the YIG out and see if we can measure it by itself. That would be one place to start. So I started taking a closer look at the the YIG oscillator here. So this obviously has a board on top of it and the main YIG oscillator core in there with the coils and the yttrium and all the other wonderful things that go inside this. I happen to have another 
older synthesizer kind of assembly here and this one had its own EEG oscillator and the EEG oscillator from that unit didn't exactly match this one as you can see the boards aren't exactly the same but the core EEG might actually be the same so I took the core EEG of the old one I put it back into this one and uh, yeah so and I closed it back up and uh, since, since I measured all the pins they all line up with the coil and the FM and the main coil all line up so this looks like it is the correct configuration then I connected it back up and this actually produces a lot more power and it goes to lower frequencies. Now, the DAC automatically adjusts the range of voltages required for this to work and I don't have the correct ranges right now because it needs to boot up and to realign it. So I'm not sure if this is the correct range of frequencies but it is worth trying and the way to do that is now to basically connect everything back up as much as possible without closing the unit and uh, run it once with this directly connected to here as a bypass and we'll see what happens and this is, should be an interesting place to start and there we have it I connected this over here and there are a couple of adjustment points that are very important so as you can imagine the range of this YIG for the same voltages isn't exactly the same as the original one so there are some adjustment places here these two potentiometers here adjust the two extreme ends of the frequency range of the YIG this one adjusts the FM coils range and this one over here adjusts the VCO range for the sampler. So all of those things need to be realigned in order for it to accept this as a new YIG oscillator core. Otherwise, it's going to go outside of the range of the alignment and move back to the same problem. So I've gone that. I've gone ahead and, and, and done that, done the arra arrangement and alignment. Now, let's put it back together. I'm really eager to see if all of this fixes the problem. And well, check it out. It looks like all the errors are gone. If you see some flickering on the screen, it's just the, the way the frame rate of my camera is lining up with the refresh rate of the CRT. I don't see that in person. And yeah, look, you see no more errors. Uh, these are all gone. So if I go under recall and I go under recall errors, there are no errors. So it certainly cleared all the issues we had. No more alignment, no more calibration problem, no more LO problem. So let's go ahead and put some signal in it. So I have it connected to my synthesizer. My synthesizer is set to 1 gigahertz and 0 dBm. Let's go ahead and enable that. And there's our signal. You can do a peak search on it. And as you can see, it is at 1 gigahertz and minus 1 dBm. I do have some loss in that cable. Looks good. Let's go to 6 gigahertz, which would put it in a separate band, so the upper band of this. Oh, actually, you know what? I just realized I should have been terminating this, and I haven't even done that. Normally, you're not supposed to run this without termination, but I forgot because I just reassembled it. So anyway, we're going to close that up, making sure you can see the that shouldn't make too much of a difference. Sometimes without it, you will get LO on level actually because uh, the output of the LO distribution network is unterminated and it's going to cause some problems. But anyway, so it looks good. Let's go ahead and uh, try 6 gigahertz. There's 6 gigahertz. We can do a peak search on that as well. There's a 6 gigahertz signal, so we can focus around it a little bit. So center frequency, 6 gigahertz. Let's make this span 10 megahertz. And it should be very accurate because I aligned it. As you can see, it is very accurate. We can reduce the resolution bandwidth to 10 kilohertz. And it looks good. It goes even lower. It's 3 kilohertz. And I can do a peak search on that as well. And it looks good. I can reduce the span even further to 1 megahertz. And there it is. As you can see, this is very good. It's clean signal because my synthesizer is clean. This is going to be limited by the phaseners of this instrument, which is significantly worse than my uh, Agilent EXG. So having said that, it looks good. So now there's one other thing I want to show you. I'm not sure how many of you have seen the inside of a YIG oscillator. So we're going to look at it under the microscope. It's a really interesting uh, unit. If you've never seen one before, I've taken a couple of, uh, open. But this one looks very nice and compact. So I think it's going to be a nice uh, addition to this video. And here's a look inside the YIG oscillator. So on the right side, we have the main coils. So you can see on the outside a very large coil and in the middle a very tiny coil. The large coil on the outside is a coarse tuning coil creating a huge magnetic field that is focused at the tip of this metallic pillar that you see here, this coarse center. The FM coil is also right at the tip there, very close to the main sphere on the left, and I'll talk about that in just a second. So the little tiny coil is used for fine frequency control, and the large coil is coarse frequency control. So the large one can tune the frequency of the gusset over a wide, wide range of frequencies. And the little one is typically used to lock the frequency with a PLL. So the magnetic flux, which is focused at the tip of this, is all directed to the yttrium core in the middle of the oscillator. That, that tiny sphere in there, which you cannot see from the camera, is the yttrium iron, iron garnet core, which is a synthetically made material. They're made of yttrium, of course, which is in the periodic element uh, tables. You can go and find it. 
the amazing thing about this material and about this composition that is made in the middle is that it, its resonance frequency can be tuned with magnetic flux. That's a little bit unusual. Most voltage control oscillators, for example, are tuned with electric field because they're used of a reactor. Now this is tuned with a magnetic field. You could do magnetic tuning of VCOs too. It's a diff topic for a different discussion. Anyway, so the middle part of there is our resonance core. So that resonance core can change with magnetic field. And what's wrapped around it is some active circuitry in order to create an oscillator. So you have you know, feedback mechanisms to create Barkhausen's criteria of oscillation, get the proper feed the phase adjustment, get the proper gain in the feedback, all the nice things that you would get with a typical oscillator. From an oscillator design point of view, you have a resonance core and an active circuitry. That part is exactly the same as with any other oscillator. So now the magnetic flux that comes out of here is focused on there with a the direct, proper direction and orientation of the sphere, which is very difficult to do. It's all manually adjusted. And the sphere is attached to this rod that you can see is coming out of there and is hanging in the middle of a loop. And that loop wraps right around the sphere and the coupling together then creates the resonance. So it's very interesting. And these four pins connected to these four uh, blades over here and these four other pins that are wire bonded actually in the middle. And then you can't see the wire bonds because they're so small and they're connected all to all the active circuitry. If I flip it on the other side, you can see the pins and the SMA, which is ultimately the output, which is taken right from there. So it would be cool to look at this under the microscope now so we can see the exact traces in the circuitry and the active components that are there and perhaps take a closer look at the yttrium core there. But now you can appreciate the, free, the, the principal operation of this thing and how magnetic tuning is used to tune the resonance frequency and ultimately change the frequency of the whole oscillator. Now, this is very different from some of the other types of oscillators. Maybe we'll do a tutorial on those later, but I'm sure it's going to be very interesting under the microscope. And here's the core of this EEG oscillator. Right in the middle, you can see the yttrium iron garnet sphere that I was talking about. The sphere is connected to this rod, which can be rotated and then inserted at this particular location in the middle of this metal loop that creates the resonance core. Now, as I said earlier, the direction, the orientation of the sphere and its location is critical. So they have to do this by hand and then cure it and then make sure it is glued properly in place. And this loop obviously doesn't touch the sphere, but the coupling of the loop to the sphere together with the magnetic field, which changes the resonance of the sphere, then creates your core resonance, which can have very high quality factor comparable to a DRO oscillator. And that loop is then connected to this trace over here, which ultimately is connected to some active circuit, which provides the the positive feedback and the gain and so on in order to create the oscillator. There are some other passives around some capacitors. Not sure what this is exactly. Could be another active device, could be a diode. Uh, but whatever it is, it's then connected ultimately to this active device. This is the RF output. These thicker lines are biasing. You can see some resistors here in the middle, which is wire bonded over. So they're not using this uh, resistor, but this one is in circuit. And this particular capacitor, again, there so is a wire bond going out to one of the pins. Now, if I move further down, actually, before I do that, let's do a measurement of this sphere. Let's see what the size of it is. It's pretty small. It shouldn't be more than half a millimeter or so. There it is. Yeah, it's just about half a millimeter. So it's a very, very small sphere. And this is a typical size for these uh, spheres. Now, if you go further down, you will see more circuitry. There it is. So a little bit more information on... What we're looking at, here's the trace, the RF trace continues on. Here's uh, the other trace for biasing. You can see some resistor here drawn on the ceramic substrate and some decoupling again connected to it. Interesting, this could be an RC. I'm not sure exactly where it goes after that. Now, if you continue, we can see some more traces and then some interesting block at the end. This, the, the frame rate is not very good. It's because of my computer simultaneously capturing high resolution images and uh, video captures. There's some another wire bond coming in, some more biasing network. It's interesting what's underneath here. I don't know. It's another ceramic uh, cap on top of it, whatever is underneath here. Could be an active circuitry by the fact that there's some bias coming to it. It's likely an active circuitry. I'm not sure exactly what it does. And then it goes to the output. Uh, but either way, this is all part of the amplifier section. It could be just a funnel amplifier. Really, it doesn't need to be anything else. The resonance is taken care of from what I was just showing earlier. So yeah, I'm pretty pretty interesting to take a look. I have opened these uh, several of these before, and I've also opened filters before, Yik Tune filters before. Maybe we'll talk about that in a different video. But you can get an idea of how this works, and really how beautiful this is. And uh, just human ingenuity is extraordinary to see that the stuff that really we come up with is amazing. So now the, I can also show you the core magnet. If you just want to see the top of the magnet, 
and it's going to take a bit of time for me to get the focus right let's see if I can do this so here's the top of the magnet let me see it's hard to get a focus while I am recording but there it is there's the top of the magnet let me see if I can get to change the polarization a little bit nope it's not going to show up very well but right here uh, we should be able to turn some of these lights off uh, to get a little bit less there it is that should be better so here's the FM coil right in the middle and you can see it's tiny and then the main coil is huge it goes all around which you cannot see of course uh, uh, at the moment because it's all it saturates the microscope because it's very reflective but yeah this is the architecture of the two two circuits it's really really quite quite amazing and a very cool thing to look at so here you can see the all of it at the same time so there it is there you have it this is a repair turned into a little bit of an educational uh, portion as well so we can take a look at some of the building blocks of a oscillator it's really difficult to focus with this while you're recording there it is and uh, i hope you enjoyed this video again this is thanks to my patreon supporters this is why i can get this equipment for repairing and produce these videos thank you so much take a look at the patreon website just so you can see what my goals are I have some really cool videos coming up. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to them as soon as possible. And I hope you enjoy this. I'll see you in the comment section.